El futuro despierta. Bienvenido al Congreso Futuro. Despierta, conéctate, participa. I want to start by thanking the organizers of this extraordinary meeting. Um, those of us who are contributing to it are enjoying it enormously. I hope that you as the audience are as well. I'm especially grateful for this opportunity to visit for the first time uh, your beautiful country. I'm also grateful to the three previous speakers because they have set the scene for what I want to talk about. Uh, Pamela and Stefano have emphasized the biological continuity of responsiveness to the environment, of communication within cells and organisms. And uh, Michel has told us about the very beginnings of humanity. I want to talk about this, the human brain. Many people have called it the most complex structure in the known universe, an enormous challenge for science, uh, but an area in which remarkable progress is being made. And that raises an interesting philosophical conundrum, because, of course, the only way that we have of understanding our brains is to use our brains to understand it. So it might be that this is one of those ultimate challenges of human intelligence, that we simply do not have the capacity to know completely about ourselves, particularly about our own brains. This is what a small section of the gray matter of the cerebral cortex looks like if you cut a section of it. This is about two millimeters from the top to the bottom uh, through the so-called gray matter that covers the whole of the surface of the brain. The black dots are nerve cells. The mass of other connections are the processes of nerve cells, the dendrites, the axons joining the cells together. This, uh, this particular section was made by the very important, famous Spanish neuroanatomist uh, Ramon y Cajal, who won the Nobel Prize for his work, who gave wonderful descriptions of the structure of the nervous system by using this particular form of staining, which involves embedding nerve cells with, with a, a silver deposit. What is interesting about this stain, and still not completely understood, is the fact that it labels only about 2% of all the nerve cells that are actually present. So this incredibly complex picture that you see is just 2% of the reality of the, of the complexity within this one tiny section of the brain. Cajal drew this diagram of an individual nerve cell. You see here the cell body and the connections from other cells distributed across the, the, the body and the dendrites of the cell. The human brain contains about 100 billion nerve cells. That's not far from the number of stars in our galaxy. You all have one of these. But each of the nerve cells has, on average, 10,000 connections from other nerve cells. So the totality of all the connections in your brain is 100 billion times 10,000, which is 1,000 million million connections. If you do the mathematics, you come to a very interesting conclusion that, on average, every person is creating one million new connections in their brain every second of their life. Of course, many of those are connections are made very early in our lives, even when we are embryos and fetuses, and shortly after birth. But we now know that the process of making, breaking, and making new connections continues throughout life. Michel talked about being able to learn now, and that's because his brain is able to change. Now, our brains are enormously dynamic organs. I want to ask how our brains evolved, how the modern human brain, our most distinctive 
feature, the thing which quantitatively and qualitatively sets us aside in many ways from the rest uh, of the living world. How did it evolve? Well, of course, we know how organisms have evolved. We know from the extraordinarily brilliant observation of Charles Darwin, partly made, of course, in this part of the world through his observations. We know how that process worked. It worked through natural selection. Here from Darwin's own words, in the struggle for survival, the fittest, the strongest, the best, best equipped, win out at the expense of their rivals because they succeed in adapting themselves best to the environment. It's a very, very simple mechanism, so beautifully elegant. The genetics which makes us and makes all other species is constantly subject to change and mutation. In reproduction, those genes are passed on to successive generations. Any change of a gene which gives a small advantage to that particular individual will be propagated by reproduction to the offspring and will therefore survive at the expense of others that do not have that genetic adaptation. The accumulation of those genetic changes results now and then in the production of a new species, literally a new species, distinct from other species, with its own particular repertoire of adaptation. If we ask what's really different about human beings, of course there are many things that are different. Our hearts are slightly different, our stomachs, our kidneys are slightly different from every other vertebrate species. But what is really remarkably distinctive is the difference in our brains. This illustration, although Michel will probably comment on it because there are many varieties of presentation of this result, but this, this graph shows the way in which the estimated total volume of the brain has changed uh, during hominid evolution. From about three million years ago, that of course is earlier than the, uh, the, the discovery that, um, that Michel described. But in that period you can see the way in which the capacity of the brain has grown from about 500 milliliters up to the modern human brain size, Homo sapiens, of about 1.7 liters of size. And you see the way in which the rate of increase of brain size, according to some estimations, has accelerated as recently as about 250,000 years ago. The study of the genetics of humans suggests that the crucial speciation event, the event at which our species was created, was, as Michel said, about 200,000 years ago. It's a very small period in evolutionary time. Very few successive generations. At that point, Modern human beings were created. They lived certainly in East Africa, but probably quite widely distributed very rapidly within parts of Africa. Their brains and their, in fact their physical appearance was very similar, essentially indistinguishable from that of modern people. If an early human being from 200,000 years ago walked into this room wearing a suit and a tie, you wouldn't be surprised by his or her appearance. He would look, she would look like a foreigner, but not like another species. And the brain of that person would be anatomically indistinguishable from yours. So how did this happen? How did this brain evolve? One thing we do know is that brains are expensive organs. They cost a lot to the animal that owns them. Our brains consume about one-fifth of all the glucose and all the oxygen which is circulating in our blood. That means we have to eat, we have to gather food very efficiently in order to, to sustain our brains. It's costly. In other words, there is biological pressure, evolutionary pressure on animals to keep their brains as small as possible. And you see that in evolution, that principle working. Why did we escape from that? The conventional argument is that there must have been some enormous adaptive value that was larger than the expense of that large brain. First of all, there must have been a genetic mechanism, mutational change, that caused the brain to enlarge. Secondly, the new bits of brain that were created must have been incorporated into the existing organization of the brain, or they would not be useful. That new organization must have had some adaptive value to early human beings, 
and that would have led to the selection of the individuals that had larger brains, therefore the survival of humanity. That's the story. Let's examine the steps. First of all, genetic enlargement of the brain. That actually is the easiest step. So biologists have now demonstrated several ways in which the brain of a mouse can be made to enlarge enormously by simple single mutational changes in, in the genes. I'll show just one of them. This is a microscopic section in this plane, the vertical plane, uh, through the brain of an embryonic mouse close uh, to the completion of gestation. It has gray matter on its cortex, the top, but it's flat. It has a very small brain and a flat cortex. Compare that with this mouse. This mouse was generated in a labo laboratory in Harvard by one genetic change, a change in the regulation of the cycling of stem cells, the cells that, the uncommitted cells that are created very early in the embryo that generate all the organs of the body. They divide and they divide and they divide and at a certain point they stop dividing and create cells that are not capable of dividing anymore. Interfering with the number of cycles of division can cause an increase in the size of the animal and in this case the size of the brain. Compare the two brains, look at the brain on the right. It doesn't have a flat surface, it has a folded surface like a human brain. We have folds in our cortex in order to compress the enormous size of the brain, the folds of the brain, into the skull. So does this mouse. So creating a very large brain is not difficult genetically. That would have been the easy step. But how could the new parts of the brain be incorporated usefully into the existing brain? This is a picture of the human brain, the right side of the human brain. It's been known since the middle of the 19th century that within that vast folded area of cerebral cortex, there are committed regions which are devoted to the analysis of each of the senses and also to the control of movement. They're, they're arranged like this. There's a strip in the middle called the motor cortex, which sends fibers down the spinal cord out to the body to control the muscles, the motor cortex. When it's stimulated, movements of the body are caused. Behind it, there's a corresponding strip that receives information from the skin, from the deep tissues of the, of the body, and it communicates with the movement area. At the back is a region that receives input from the eyes and processes visual information. Damage there can make, can make you blind, cort cortical blindness. And there's a, an area devoted to hearing at the top of the temporal lobe. Small regions within this enormous brain committed to particular functions. What about the rest? Where did it come from? What does it do? Well, if we look at the, the pattern of distribution of those major sensory areas in existing species from present day animals that are probably representative of our ancestry at different stages. Look, for instance, at um, the hedgehog. The hedgehog, the current day hedgehog, is probably very similar to the earliest insectivores, very early placental mammals. And what you see is the touch areas colored in red and orange, the visual area in blue, the auditory area in green, are quite similarly distributed to the human brain. If you compare at the top the human brain, there are the equivalent areas, the blue, the red, and uh, the green. The difference is the addition of extra space between those committed areas. It is, it is not possible to go from a hedgehog brain to a human brain just by inflating it like a balloon. Additional cortex has been added. Well, what does that cortex do? And how is it useful to animals that have larger brains? A great deal of, of knowledge has been gained through the study of animals, but now we can use brain scanning methods in humans to confirm and extend the observations that have been made uh, in animal species. Um, the technique of magnetic resonance scanning can be used to measure local blood flow in the brain, and that is an indication of activity in the brain, nerve cell activity. So we can look at changes in blood flow to identify which parts of the brain are active when a person looks at something, listens to something, moves part of their body, speaks a word, we can see the different parts of the brain that are involved. 
So, if we ask a person lying in the scanning machine to look at a television screen and project on that television screen a static pattern, not moving, of dots, and ask which part of the brain becomes active, exactly the part that a 19th century neurologist would have expected, the area at the back of the cortex, the classic visual cortex, which receives information from the eyes. But if we now ask the person to look at the same pattern moving, and now ask the computer to tell us which parts of the brain become active as a result of the movement, looking at the difference in activity between the two, we see different areas, just about here above your ears, two areas not present in a hedgehog, which are specifically devoted to the analysis of movement in the field. Take another experiment. Ask the person in the scanner to look at pictures projected on a screen, pictures of human faces or pictures of objects made by human beings, one after the other presented at, at random, and then ask whether there is any part of the brain that responds more to the faces than to the objects, and vice versa. And there is. This is a section through the brain, lower down. You can see the eyes at the front. And those two areas, the orange area and the blue area, responded distinctively to faces on the one hand and objects on the other. Small, distinct, specialized regions. The conclusion from this sort of work is that the whole of the space which has been created through late stages of evolution is packed with computational modules, additional small computers, neural computers, which have been added to process and reprocess sensory information coming in through the, through the sense organs. The conclusion is a curious one. It means that a lot of our, in, our intelligence, our cognition, our additional abilities are due to increased understanding of the nature of the outside world, created by adding more and more computational power to the analysis of our senses. I think this might show sequentially what has happened during evolution in one particular pathway within the brain. And, and I'm going to describe experiments using magnetic resonance imaging to define different areas shown in different colors, responding to different kinds of stimulation. Now, we know that at the back of the brain, the visual cortex, there are responses to stationary patterns. And we know that if moving patterns are shown, this area in front of the classical visual cortex becomes active the blue, the dark blue area. The green area just in front of that is specifically activated by this kind of stimulus called biological motion. I think you agree you instantly see the impression of a moving person, yes? But each dot that's moving is no different from any of the dots in the other image. They're just, actually it's, it's computer generated, a set of small moving dots. But the correlation in the pattern of the movement very distinctively signals, signifies the nature of the relative motion of parts of a biological creature. And we are very sensitive to it, very fast at detecting it. And that's because we have a devoted region in our brain for that analysis. You can imagine, I think, during evolution as the brain has grown, these additional capacities for analysis have been added. What about the purple area? The final step in this process of analysis, sensory analysis. What did that respond to? And the answer is, it responded to verbs, spoken verbs, or the appearance of written verbs, language. Well, if you think about it, not all verbs are verbs of movement, but I suspect that many of the earliest verbs that human beings used were all about movement. Run, jump, catch, leap, stab. They would be active expressions and commands or instructions. Isn't it interesting that it's possible that the mechanism for analyzing such words evolved as the continuation of the analysis of the process of visual movement? Well, why are large brains adaptive? That's the next step. Why is it adaptive to have a larger brain? Well, here's the answer on a magazine that I found in Britain. This magazine will make you smarter, more clever, because you read it and your brain is small to begin with, and after you've read it, your brain is much bigger. Well, of course, that's not Darwinism, but it is 
suggesting that a large brain is more clever than a small brain. I think that would be generally accepted, but with some intriguing exceptions. Some creatures with very tiny brains, wasps, bees, many birds, are incredibly intelligent in a devoted and dedicated way at doing particular tasks. The particular feature of the human brain that I think is special is the ability to direct that intelligence to such an enormous range of different tasks and in different ways. So we have all the steps. We have the genetically controlled enlargement of the brain, the reorganization to incorporate the new brain, the adaptive value. What about the selection, then, of the individuals? What we have to say if we follow Darwin's dogma is that the emergence of that brain 200,000 years ago gave those creatures an advantage over others at the same time so they survived more efficiently. Do we see any evidence in the fossil record that the earliest human beings used the cognitive capacities of their enormous brain? Perhaps Michel will contradict me, but everything I read tells me that the early life of human beings, for at least the first 50,000 years, was pretty much indistinguishable from the life of a present-day chimpanzee. Early humans lived in small groups, maybe 12, 15, 20 people, almost certainly with a hierarchical structure, with a dominant male. They organized hunting parties to go out. They occasionally had battles with their neighbors. They killed other animals and ate them. They foraged for food, and that might have been a responsibility more of the females in the group. They had a coherent society, very similar to that of chimpanzees. Compare their life with our life. Why are you here? You're here because you read about it. You heard about it. You looked at your computer screen and saw the announcements on the internet. You made your way across this city, which was laid out for you hundreds of years ago. You came to this building, which was created with this space for you to sit with your colleagues. You knew what was going to happen. You're hearing me because I'm wearing something that somebody invented that's capable of enlarging my voice and transmitting it. I'm using a computer to display the pictures. All of that knowledge, that technology, that accumulation of cognitive ability from you and from other human beings has generated this moment in the life of our species, this one event. Infinitely different from our ancestors for the first 50,000 years of human existence, yet they already had our brains. There's been no substantial genetic change since then. This is a very worrying fact. First of all, how do we explain it? If everything was set and made genetically then, how can we be so different now? And secondly, what about Darwin? How could we have survived if the thing that was made to be adaptive was doing so little at the time? This is a real paradox. I can't solve the second of those questions, but I think it's a very important issue. So the, the problem is, Summarized here, a very um, eminent um, geneticist, evolutionary biologist, Stephen Oppenheimer. What he shows is two graphs. The solid lines show the increase in the size of the human brain over evolutionary time, very similar to my first graph. The other line he labels technical, cultural innovation. Very flat at the beginning, almost no change in culture, but then progressively accelerating the beginning of trade and exchange of materials over long distances, perhaps 150,000 years ago. The earliest evidence of decorative art, 60,000 years ago. Agriculture, maybe 20, 30,000 years ago. Reading and writing, absolutely critical, 3,000 years ago. Science, 500 years ago. Really modern technology, computing, going to the moon, all in the last 50 years. So this fantastic acceleration must be due to something other than Darwinian evolution. Now, I'm not going to say that it's due to magic. It certainly isn't due to divine intervention, I think. It's due to a biological process different from conventional evolution. And it was actually first described, surprisingly, by this man in the 17th century, Thomas Willis. Actually, uh, Michel showed a picture of John Locke, the, the famous philosopher, British philosopher, John Locke worked as a laboratory assistant to Thomas Willis, the greatest neurologist in Europe at the time, and a very great scientist. There were no boundaries between philosophy and science at the time. Willis was really quite remarkable. You can see from this illustration that one of his hobbies was 
dissection, including dissection of the human body and the human brain. And he compared the brains of different animals and made dramatic conclusions, very modern in feeling, by comparing the different sizes and forms of the brains of animals. And his principal conclusion was that the human brain was distinguished from other brains because of its size. And he concluded that this must be something to do with the special mental capacities of human beings, our perception, our thoughts, our rational intelligence, our memory, our, our volition, our ability to decide. And, and of course, he was right. I'll show you one quotation. And by the way, the illustration from his book, this beautiful illustration of the human brain, the first really accurate picture in the scientific record, was not drawn by Willis, it was drawn by his other laboratory assistant, Christopher Wren, the great architect who designed St. Paul's Cathedral. He said, he said and here's a, a, a quotation from Willis, these folds, the folding of the brain, are far more and greater in a man than in any other living creature. Absolutely right. To wit, and that means in order to, give the various and manifold actions of the superior faculties. This is wonderful 17th century English. Superior faculties means the high-level cognitive functions, perception, thought, memory, reason, and so on. So the brain is bigger to accommodate all those things. But, and this is the crucial phrase, they are garnished, or decorated, with an uncertain, as it were, fortuitous series. What he was saying was that as he looked at the brains of different people, the detailed structure of the folds were slightly different. And they are. What was his conclusion? That the exercises of the animal function, from the Latin anima meaning mind, the mind function, might be free and changeable. So he was saying that the brains of individuals could be changed by the action of their higher faculties, which seems bizarre, and did seem bizarre until the 1960s, when scientists, neurobiologists, began to discover more and more examples of the way in which brains can change as a result of exercise, of the exercise of our faculties. Brain plasticity, as it's now called, continues through the whole of life. It's especially pronounced early in life as young, young animals learn to see to hear, to control their actions, but it continues through the whole of life. And of course, we should have known that before the 1960s because we can all remember things. We can all learn things. And that must depend on changes in our brain. For personal memories, conscious memories of your own experiences, what you had for breakfast today, for instance, what was the last book that you read, that kind of very personal memory, one particular part of the brain is especially involved. And it's shown here. It's inside the brain. We're looking from the inside of the brain outwards, underneath the temporal lobe, that region called the hippocampus. It's known that from some very rare cases, clinical cases, when that region is damaged, people have a devastating disorder of memory. They can remember everything in the past. They can remember how to ride a bicycle. They can remember how to speak their language. They remember all the historical events in their lives, but they cannot form new long-term memories. Every day is completely fresh to them. They can't ever learn to recognize the doctors and the nurses who are treating them. They can't form new memories. And that seems then to be the function of this structure. In animals, the hippocampus is much more concerned with navigation, spatial memory, finding the way around the space that you're in. And there's very lovely evidence that that's true in humans too, in parts of the hippocampus. We've inherited that. I'm going to describe very briefly a beautiful experiment done by Eleanor Maguire, a researcher in London, to try to investigate whether the hippocampus of humans was active when people were exercising their personal memories. So she asked people before they went into the scanning machine to play a computer game with a virtual space represented, a virtual town. And you know the kind of game where you have to move from room to room within a space displayed, a virtual space displayed on a screen. And they learnt this space by practice until they knew all the arrangements of the streets and the doors and the rooms, the cinemas and so on that were displayed there. 
She then put them into the scanner and said, OK, find your way as quickly as possible by moving the, the cursor to go to the, the snooker room or to the cinema. So people lay there going very quickly, calling up their spatial memories. And she detected which part of the brain was most active. And there it was, that bright orange spot in the middle is the right hippocampus, active while the person's remember, remembering that particular spatial task. Interestingly, she didn't stop there. She said, OK, if there is this dedicated part of the brain involved in memory, does it change as someone becomes more and more skilled at spatial memory? So she tried to think of a group of people who were particularly good at spatial navigation and spatial memory. And she chose to look at taxi drivers. London taxi drivers have to pass an examination called the knowledge, which tests their detailed knowledge of, of all the streets in London and how to get there. They have to learn this over the course of two or three years of training. So their, their head is full of spatial information. They are a walking map. So she looked at the hippocampus of taxi drivers. She didn't just look at activity, she looked at the size of the hippocampus. She measured the size of the right hippocampus in taxi drivers while they were learning to take the examination called the knowledge. And this is the result. It grows. The hippocampus grows over a period of months or years as the taxi driver is learning more and more spatial information. And when taxi drivers retire, it shrinks. So our brains can, parts of our brain can literally grow as we exercise them, just as Thomas Willis said. There's another way of looking at the extent to which our brains are free to change, and that's to look at identical twins. Identical twins have the same genetics. So if genetics, if genes control the structure of the brain completely, then the brains of a pair of identical twins will be identical, and they're not. This shows the result of a, a study in which the thickness of the gray matter of the cortex in all across the cerebral cortex was compared between pairs of twins. In the left column, the twins were not identical twins, they're non-identical fraternal twins, but very closely related, but not genetically identical. On the right, they are identical twins, they have the same genetics. The colors indicate the similarity of thickness. The more red the color, the more similar the thickness between the pair of twins. The more blue and purple the areas, the less similar. What you see is that, not surprisingly, the identical twins have more red, they have more similarity. But there are regions in the brain, many parts of the brain, in identical twins, which are as different from each other as between pairs of non-related, completely unrelated people. So there's still that degree of freedom, even with exactly the same genetic control and the same home environment. So the brain is very free. There are hundreds now of wonderful examples of way, the way in which the brain of an adult person can change as a result of the use of the brain. If you learn to play the violin, then the regions of your brain involved in controlling your your fingering hand enlarge. If you learn to play the piano, and you've never learned before, but you learn for a week, the hand areas on both sides of your brain will enlarge. And here, a group of teenagers learning to play, for the first time, the computer game Tetris. Very simple computer game. They'd never played computer games before. Very unusual to find kids that haven't, but here they are. They were given access to the computer game for a few minutes each day for one week. They were scanned before doing that and at the end of the week. And this diagram shows all the areas of the brain, the colored areas, that had changed in thickness of gray matter as a result of playing computer games. And this is in adolescent children, 14, 15 years of age. And here perhaps, well, from some of my own work, one of the most dramatic examples, I, I wanted to study blind people to see whether the parts of their brain which are now no longer receiving information because they're connected to the eyes, the whole of the back of the brain, whether they might be used in some other way by the brain. So, first, I put into, this, into the scanning machine normal, sighted, not blind individuals and showed them moving visual patterns on the left, 
identified the region of the brain that's active. There it is, this motion-sensitive area. You've seen that illustration before. And then looking at faces, that distinctive region on the right side, the fusiform face area as it's called. These regions are visually activated areas dedicated to movement and to faces. I then blindfolded the normal observers and compared their reactions in the scanner to people who had been blind for at least 20 years but had some vision early in life, so-called late-onset blindness. And I asked them all, the normal people, the blind people, to touch a number of different objects, including the head of a doll placed into their hand, which instantly to everybody felt like a face, a human face, or a deformed doll's head, which had all the same surface features but didn't feel like anything, just an unidentifiable object. And that unidentifiable object was, was either static or moving across the skin. So now I could ask the computer to show me whether there are any parts of the brain which are activated specifically by a moving touch or by the touch of a face. And what I found was that in normal sighted people, there are not. Nothing, hap nothing distinctive happens. But in blind people, there is strong activation by the moving tactile stimulus in exactly the same area of the brain that's activated by visual movement in a, in a normal sighted person. That that visual region of the cortex has been taken over by a different sense. And equally, when they touch the doll's head and feel the face, their brain activates an area indistinguishable from the visual face area. So these areas which, are, which were devoted to vision, these computational modules, have been borrowed by the tactile sense and presumably help the blind person to analyze touch. How that's done, I have no idea, but that is an indication of how our brains, how, how radically our brains are capable of reorganizing. So I just want to conclude by reminding you of our history, of our cultural history, events of the last three or 4,000 years, significant events. All of these things have happened without genetic change, and they've happened because of the plasticity of individual brains. But not just that. They've happened because of the capacity of human brains to communicate with each other. Language, principally, is the vehicle for transmitting information from one brain to another brain. We're here because we share the knowledge of all the people who made the city, made the building, designed the computers, made the mi microphones, so on and so on. We share all of that knowledge because we can understand what they've done, we know that they've done it, we can learn the instructions for how to use it. So human beings are a collaborative species, but they're a cognitively collaborative species. So we have inherited generation by generation the knowledge of previous generations. We don't inherit that genetically, we generate it by education. Thinking of the future, because that's the theme of this session, just to conclude, there are two messages from what I'm saying. There's the good news and the bad news. The good news is there's no hint that this process is slowing down. You saw the estimates of cultural evolution. It just goes up and up and up. We will be as different from people in 500 years' time as 16th century people, 16th century people were different from us now. There's no reason to believe that the rate of change will be different. That's a reason for hope for the future when we face these huge challenges. But the whole process on which that depends is incredibly fragile, much more fragile than genetic evolution, because it depends on personal knowledge and education, the transmission of that knowledge. A single generation without schools, without libraries, without the internet, without education, will be literally back in the Stone Age because we are no different from those people who lived in Africa 200,000 years ago. Thank you. El futuro... 
Bienvenido al Congreso Futuro. Despierta, conéctate, participa.